Good, good, good. Can we do some chit chat? We haven't caught up in a long time. You don't mind? <laughs> <laughs> we try to catch up just before the conference to kind of align on a few subjects and uh, trying to get three CEOs to meet up for 20 minutes is uh, mission impossible. <laughs> so this is raw. He was on a panel. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So today we're going to talk uh, a little bit about scaling in, in the region and it's, it's a topic that has uh, created a lot of... Uh, uh, concerns, uh, people say that it's harder to scale in the Middle East than it is in, in, in other parts of the world because of the difficult jurisdictions and, and things take longer. So I think my first question is, do you guys who both have scaled massive operational uh, businesses, a lot more than mine, um, across the region, would you agree that it is more complicated to do this in the Middle East than it is in Asia or in LATAM, not that you guys have been there, but you've obviously spoken to entrepreneurs from that part of the world. Um, do you think that we have massive hurdles in this region? I mean, I can speak... Uh, I mean, I, first of all, I think scaling overall is a challenge. And uh, now that kind of I'm a bit involved with Amazon, I mean, scaling requires that your product is really good and that you understand your customers really well. And I think when you miss that, then scaling becomes more difficult. And what I can say from the soup days is, because sometimes we want to do things fast, or we invested less in the tech part, we ended up putting some manual work around, thinking that the region cannot support the automated processes, or mm -hmm. the systems can't support the, the current demographic or geographies or whatever, like if you don't have a map, you end up maybe doing something around it for a city or whatever. And then that becomes really a kind of an impedance for growth. So I think when we talk about scaling, people always should like, if you're not scaling, it's like the product has too much friction and the customer's <laughs> say in the product is less than what it should be. I think that's kind of fundamentally we should not blame that on the region or what you're doing. I think just take that out. I think, yes, you can. I can tell you from our Germany where, where things are different, but I think that is a fundamental like, foundation of scale. And where you, when you're innovating, it's like very easy to look at the one to three, but it's actually the three to seven that is important. So have you scaled further since Amazon I think we just Souk, and can you compare... To how I mean, it was comparing prior how to the acquisition I, 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 and now, I mean, I, I'm not going to comment too much on so, but I think comparing how uh, Amazon looks at scale and how like the business of AWS or retail or it's just the mindset of really putting the customer first allows you to think of for solutions that help you to scale. It may not be at our size as fast as we want because it's a bit of more of a long-term play. Mm -hmm. And for our needs and where we were, I don't think some of them are applicable, but I think by putting the customer as a center, I found that you will be able to scale because you address some of the issues that you're going to stumble on as you go a bit early in the process. Yeah, if you don't yeah. fix those before scaling, then you're just replicating problems. Yeah, and, and, and that here where I, I would come, like another. our journey we launch in Dubai, it's almost like if you launch in Dubai, you're putting yourself up that you're not going to scale well, because the minute you go to the next country, which is big, <laughs> nothing here applies there, and you spend a lot of time thinking that you're doing well here. We need it because, and this is where the region, I think, the composition of the countries and where users adapt technology faster and how you can test in a market, where most of us launched here, it's simple, it's easy, there is some ecosystem you can rely on. The minute you cross one border over, just everything breaks apart, and then you end up focusing a lot there, and then that kind of impedes maybe the growth uh, in other places. And I think you almost may launch the other way around if you have to do it from scratch. Uh, just from a capital perspective and the buying power of the countries, we end up always doing things here. That sometimes may not work for a business like ours where there's a huge uh, offline component of that business. Maybe if you're virtual, it, it won't matter as much, but if... Uh, you have, uh, we have warehouses, products, uh, dealerships, uh, uh, rights of brands in different markets, distribution rights, uh, logistic licenses, uh, payment stop, licenses. Stop, stop, I'm a the again. ecosystem suddenly <laughs> changes, right? The ecosystem changes drastically. So then you end up with so many different setups to solve, and you thought, like when you launched here, that most of them were solved. Yeah. Was so, that how Look, I think the answer is, uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's very, very challenging. 
and it's uh, doable at the same time, right? Given that we've done it, it can be done. But what makes it challenging are three factors. Uh, one is uh, the fragmentation of the region. It's a lot more fragmented than uh, many parts of the world. And every country, sometimes every emirate, has a different legal entity requirement, operational requirement, licensing requirement that you have to just figure out and uh, add to your expansion playbook. So it ends up costing a lot more money, ends up costing a lot more time, and it's very, very painful and laborious. So that's one part. So you had to fight different battles against the taxis or, or against the limousine systems differently per, per market. Yeah, and for us, that dimension becomes even more tricky, right? Because we believe that our business is a city-by-city city business, not even a country-by-country country business. So the fragmentation is of 120 cities versus 15 countries that we are in. So the fragmentation overall makes it, makes it challenging. You start a company in California, you can target people in New York and Florida without a problem, right? It's just it's one place, Good one market. set of integrations, one infrastructure. It works seamlessly. Second, the region is also a bit less open than other parts of the world, right? So in many countries, until recently, you needed a local partner. You had to go through a lot of the legal paperwork, uh, you know, to make sure that you're able to scale properly in those markets. So that has made things challenging. We're in the process of opening Algeria, and now we have to figure out who that local partner will be. We have to give them 51%. If you give them 51%, how do we get money in that country? Where do we pay them back? What's going to happen if they you know, decide they want to keep that business? So there are complications that come up on the legal side. And the third bit is what Ronaldo referred to. The businesses that we are doing are very operational. So you need a lot of infrastructure on the ground to make it happen as well. And the infrastructure is different in different markets. In some places, maps work. In some places, credit cards are there. In some places, there are other payment systems. There are different SMS systems in other places. There are contact centers that require a different infrastructure. So the fragmentation, the more the restrictive nature of the region and the fact that the underlying infrastructure doesn't exist makes scaling challenging and costly. At the same time, and it's not, it's not rocket science, right? It can be done, it, it has been done. And the thing that has worked for us, if there is one thing that has worked for us, and that thing has been find the right local leader who knows how to navigate all of the things in the local markets. And if you can, get the right investors or allies that can assist local that markets. local leader with that journey. And then it happens. Yeah. yeah, I think having the local leaders for us has been, I think that's uh, the most instrumental mm -hmm. because they are local and you empower them enough and then you're able to leverage your technology yeah. across multiple geography. If you don't have that head on the ground helping you, it just becomes really hard to do everything, I guess, uh, functionally horizontally. I guess everyone now is wondering, well, how do you find that local leader, <laughs> right? <laughs> It's, it's, it's the billion dollar question. We, I mean, we were lucky. We looked at people who've done startups because we were in startup mode, so I couldn't hire people from a corporate environment. They had, for whatever reason, their businesses either didn't scale, we could absorb it, we could manage to do a deal with them. I remember when Omar Saududi joined us, he was running a carport, and I'm like, let's just buy it and give you shares for it, and can you just move and run it, <laughs> run this business? We're launching Egypt in a month, and we need someone. And I just felt him being an entrepreneur. Uh, just helped and then we agreed on the cause like we felt you know we're doing something important the money wasn't there yet this is 210 mm -hmm. uh, but you know like empowering Egyptian merchants sounds like really a powerful mission to go by and hiring good people and building an organization we aligned on those he was an entrepreneur so his expectation and and kind of the way he ran the business was very different than many of the Egyptian corporate people who worked at PNG that I was trying to hire and in the interview the guy saying do I get a driver do I get a secretary I'm like no I don't have a driver I don't have a secretary this is not the kind of job we want you to run so it was very evident that we couldn't hire in Egypt, someone like from a big corporate world. Yeah, we say, we, we, we say that a failed entrepreneur is much better than a Harvard MBA, no. right? They come, I mean, Someone they who fail, knows also the region, right? That we're hiring that leader for the local, yeah. right? So he has to be super connected yeah. uh, with the region he's operating in. He has to be passionate to fight because you may be in a new market and you have priorities in the bigger market and you're never going to get to a product feature that supports uh, yeah. the local market. So you always, okay, yeah, this is like, okay, let's, we'll get to it. And then they, like a year passed by and you're holding him accountable. It's like, but I, so, I, I, so, I kept so telling him, you need to fight hard enough within our teams to get your share of features. You actually have to over index the newer markets with more features to make them work than the existing bigger market. And that's a hard trade-off because if you're trying as a startup to raise capital, build your top line, 
you, you, by focusing a lot on the smaller market, the, the, the value payback from those it may take needle. two years. You come to you do your next raise, you can say, like, I spend the year working on Egypt. Like, okay, but you, where is your top line? So I so think there's the struggling first, entrepreneurs in the room that are looking to join exciting businesses. I know that oftentimes when I speak with founders or CEOs of big tech companies and they're like, I would much rather hire someone who's, you know, hasn't found the right co-founder or something went wrong with his board or he just couldn't go to his Siri B or A um, and join the business. They usually add a lot more value than, um, than a consultant or someone that comes from the big corporate world. Yeah. Mudasser, maybe, you, you know, you deal with people, you deal with drivers all around the region. Maybe you can share with us one of the craziest story that happened at Karim while scaling and going into those remote markets where you, where you operate. <laughs> we call I mean, them captains, by the way, uh, as opposed to drivers. But, uh, captains, Thank true. you. A lot of stories. Um, and I think there's one story that has repeated itself a few times, um, which is the fact that you know, there was a lot of pressure to expand and go into new markets. So we start the business in Dubai as a corporate car booking service. And all the consultants, bankers that live in Dubai a lot of their time is actually spent in Saudi during the week and they need travel arrangements in Saudi. So we had to go to Saudi uh, and in the beginning we had nothing in Saudi, right? So how do you open up Saudi when you don't have a legal entity, when you don't have a local partner for the legal entity? So you basically say, what do I need to open in Saudi? You need a few devices. They need to have the right software on it. You take them with you next time you go to Saudi and you basically equip uh, a few devices and few cars, and then the service is up and running in Saudi. So as a start, that sounds like a genius idea, it works. But guess what happens? Then you have to figure out how do you pay these captains on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And you know, a lot of these captains don't have bank accounts or don't want to you know, give their bank accounts, or we don't even have a legal presence that you know, if this was caught, then this might be a problem. So you find some local operations manager, supply manager, you're like, dude, your bank account is a Kareem bank account. <laughs> and you start sending hundreds of thousands of dollars, at some point millions of dollars to this account as the business is scaling and you still don't have a legal entity. And as you need to... Uh, That's what happened to your money, Danny, see? <laughs> <laughs> and as you need to start uh, sending more and more devices that you need to equip uh, cars with, you know, there are many examples where you know, customs would open up our bags and say, what, what business are you in again? <laughs> they would see a lot of mobile phones that we were transporting into Saudi, open up the phone, see what's on it. So uh, this has happened repeatedly uh, in, uh, in almost all markets, and we have had people sometimes even take a lot of cash to the markets to sort of distribute uh, to, the, to the captains. And there are many funny pictures as well where you know, one of our early uh, colleagues, Abdullah Lamadi, some of you might know him, he was opening Kuwait, and we had an arrangement with a limo company in Kuwait where we would pay them a certain amount of money, and then we agreed on a bonus that we would pay the captains directly. And for the bonus, every two weeks, he would fly into Kuwait with a bucket load of cash, and then he would basically have a line of people that he would be distributing cash to one by one based on the bonuses they have earned. So um, a lot of the stories are around just doing things manually, you know, hustling on the ground, getting things done. And then there are product market fit issues, right? You go to a market, something that works well in Dubai, doesn't work in Saudi, doesn't work well in Morocco. You just have to figure out how do you learn, stay close to the market, and keep it trading. Thanks for that. Thanks. Ryan, do you have a cash story? We have, we have many cash stories. I, I, one of them... Uh, cash story as in on, just the, on the cash on the The whole delivery? issue of managing cash is yeah. quite, uh, I think, uh, you, you can't run a business that have cash and not have Probably. millions of stories. Uh, one, uh, during Eid, Saudi Bank shut down like uh, seven days. Uh, As so they do, right? Two, three Eids ago, we delivered, 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 delivered. And we've, because to insure these stations, you need to have a certain class of safes. Now we have deposit machines. So we deposit actually in the station when the drivers come back to pay the merchants quite fast. So the minute you put the money in the ATM at the station, you scan the receipt, it actually reconciles with the merchant. At the time, we didn't have that, so people people would put, would put, and then I get a call like midnight Saturday, which is the last day, let's say Eid was Sunday, I was like, uh, you need to see this, and literally um, a truck drove into this FC, took this room, 
with the safe, loaded it, and we're watching it on video, and we have it actually all taped, Sally. and they just like yeah. moved the whole room with the safe out of it, like, I don't know how many millions are in it, and we're like, okay, this is super, like, so it's like, so when you have cash, there's always... Was uh, it Saudi? I, yeah, in Saudi, so oh. always issues, but I think for us, the biggest push to scale and do things fast, we flipped our model, um, you know, from a listing-based one, and we picked Egypt, it was going through Arab Spring, so we said, you know, this is a good market to test, and then uh, we prepared everything. Everything was running fine. I'm like, how much are we going to be down? We're going to be down like 10 hours. I'm like, okay, you know what? We're switching the platform. We learn a lot. We go and flip the site. And I am like in Dubai. The team is in, in a big office in Cairo. Country manager, sellers. We're just telling everyone, hold. You have to list. And then like 12 hours goes by. I go to bed a bit like at 5 a.m. Wake up at 10. The site still says like, you know, no site. So I called like Wissam, who's running technology. Like, What's going on? I'm like, we're migrating, we're having issues, something is not working. I'm like, okay. Happens half best. hour, half hour, one hour later, like, I mean, like now it's like business hours, right? So I'm like, Wissam, we need to do something. We can't like tell the customers that we're just gone. So he said, okay, I have a good idea. So literally he wires a video feed into the room that we are like working in, like where they have a room with like 30 engineers and trying to figure out what catalog to migrate, what system is not working. And literally we're feeding like life out of the, this room and suddenly like the comments on the page like, yalla, should do halko and get going. Like the customers just totally like, instead of bitching at us, where are you? And they see like these people like one day, 20, and we, we went I think two, two and a half days till we went live. Uh, it was like a crazy story. I'm like, the best thing is like, tell the customers and tell the merchant like we're actually really working or we're in this office. And it was a live feed without audio. So you could just feed people looking around, you see people <laughs> sleeping and we just like contended that, you know, when you're screwing up, just tell the customer you're exactly. screwing up and move on. <laughs> Put your hands up and say, I messed up. <laughs> Amazing. Sometimes when you're transparent, I think it helps. When you try to like kind of corporate-wise cookie an issue, yeah. it just really backfires. I think people now, especially with social media, she just threw it. They're like, you know, I say, my, our guys are working. Yusuf haven't slept in 24 hours. <laughs> Imad didn't sleep in three hours. Like, it just, we were updating the page, and we were, like, getting customers to really rally behind us till we went up. Yeah, like Zuckerberg now says, yeah, two accounts have been, pri you know, have been prioritized, right? <laughs> he comes up and says every time a little, a little glitch goes wrong because you want to make sure yeah. that... He's transparent about it. Uh, Mudassar, if you had to do it all over again, um, can you tell us or tell the, the audience here what are the things that you would do differently so that you could probably do it better, cheaper, and faster? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe some of the mess-ups that you've been through and, and uh, because of, 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 of those... Yeah. So, so I think, it, look, it, um, there is a, maybe two uh, high-level reflections. One is uh, the pace of expansion and where to expand, uh, some learnings on that one. And second is, who do you entrust with that, uh, you know, responsibility? And on the first one, you know, we were, in the early days, we were going anywhere that we could find anyone in. So uh, someone came to us and said, you should be in Lebanon. We are like, are you interested? Let's launch tomorrow. That was my strategy uh, <laughs> too. <laughs> so uh, we were very, very, you know, trigger happy. Hey, one more city on the map. Let's get there before competition does and start scaling that market. Uh, so we were not as deliberate about where we should go and uh, as strategic as we should have. And then you can open up all of these markets and you put them on the map. But then, you know, the real hard work starts when you sort of need to scale that business, need to start doing all the legal work, the operational work, the scaling work that needs to go into a market. And when you end up with, let's say, 10 countries that you've just opened up in this way, then you start losing focus from the really important ones because all of these, the fires are coming from places that you just opened up on a whim and didn't think too much. So I think one lesson is be a little bit more strategic in expansion, be a little bit more disciplined. It's good to get excited, but uh, let's contain that excitement and be more strategic. And the second learning is around people, right? And as I said at the beginning, you know, it is all about people. And if you get the right people on board, things happen without you having to do much. And somehow if you struggle to get the right people on board, then it's a struggle all the way. So um, I think in, in some places, you know, and you will make mistakes because you're making decisions so quickly. 
that sometimes you will make mistakes on, on people, right? You bring someone on board, you thought they were ex amazing, they were exciting, but they start doing the things that Ronaldo mentioned. They want a driver, they want a secretary, they want all of these things. And then you quickly realize that this is not a good fit, but now you opened up that market, you're managing 15 other markets, you don't have time to go into that market. So you sort of procrastinate the tough decision, right? And the longer you delay it, the bigger it becomes, because this person then starts recruiting a team that is like them, right? That likes that culture, that likes that uh, environment. And then even if you get rid of that person, there is a much bigger turnaround that needs to happen of the entire organization. So the second learning is be a little bit quicker in, uh, in decisions, especially when it comes to markets that are a little bit further away, that you're not going to be there on the ground day to day. Uh, because the person that is on the ground leading that place is is your ambassador, right? Mm -hmm. And that has to be fully, fully aligned with your values and culture. We had a term in suit called like the guts to fire assholes. Mm -hmm. And we just couldn't do it. Like I, exactly for what Mutasir said, like we have a person, like I just, like you could tell, he's sharp, works hard, and he's delivering reasonably. It's just like- He's a jerk. You sit in a room, it's like, and you need like, it doesn't represent me. It doesn't represent my value. It doesn't represent the way I'm running the company. The minute I, and I could tell like, even if he's trying, he's just naturally an asshole to people. <laughs> and we would like, I would go home like, and has this like, and then you say, I have to go back, restructure the team. I think this guy will leave. He will take this guy to a competitor. He has the data of the company. Let's not open this can of worm. I need to fix this problem. We want to launch it. And, you know, and one time it, it daunted on me. We were in, a, I mean, we have different teams, right? Like you have a head of customer service, head of operator. And we're in an airport. Like we, we, anyone who goes to Saudi at night, like if you're on a Thursday night flight, you run into all the consultants. As much as well, you're going to run into one of And I'm sitting with him and we have one of our like really senior leaders that he probably doesn't get along with. And he just doesn't say hi to him. And this guy is spending all his weeks in Saudi, basically serving his business. And I'm like, I went home. I'm like, halos, like it's done tomorrow. I need to do it. And it took me another two months. Like, it's just hard. To have that conversation, yeah? To have like, you know what? I don't think this is a fit. I want you to do this versus this. Give him something that he just resigns or you let him go. And you know, it, it was hard. I think that is the most single mm. trigger thing that I would want to be hard around. But we like people, we have value around fun. We have value around, you know, like camaraderie is a big thing when you have a, a startup that's growing fast and just alienating those, those dynamics. But they've always come back and haunted us. And the, I agree with you 100%. Like delaying is just really delaying that. And you just like, as might as well just deal with the consequences early because the minute they recruit what looks like them, then the problem just gets harder and the turnaround gets harder. And I, I've never like, we knew it was like, and if you look at like one year back, you say, we knew it then. We know it now. We actually finally moved on it. Why we just didn't do it early? Just why did we wait? It's hard. Yeah. Jack well said, no. hire slowly, fire quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I, I mean, it's not about fire quickly. Like just someone is not a fit. It's just yeah. not good with, maybe it's not, and yeah, we've we tolerated good, people who make mistakes. It's just quickly. the attitudes. Like, you know, like we don't need this attitude. We're all stretched. We're all working hard. We need to come to the room and feel like a positive energy. Uh, I like criticism, that's not an issue, but just like being mean to people and just like just doesn't work in a startup environment. You, you have to sacrifice a bit of the brain if you have to, because yeah. it just makes everyone else just kind of, it's worse if they copy him, and if it's worse if he demoralizes the good guys. So it's a tough decision. Yeah, and then it, it, it creates a bad culture, right? We say yeah, you culture. Told her, the fact that you see it and you can't say a lot. Maybe you say it to him one on one, but the fact that others think like you're okay with it just because you don't comment on it, that's where it, like, it just wouldn't sit well. I would go to the hotel and I'm like, damn, like, we just got to do this. It's hard. Did you do it? We did it. <laughs> I read a book called The Hard Things About Hard Thing next day. Yeah. I was like, you know what? <laughs> it didn't take one day. And someone asked me, like, what's the best book you read? And I'm like, the hard thing about it. I'm like, why? I'm like, and he was with his boss. I'm like, because I could fire someone. And then he looked at his boss. I'm like, don't fire me. <laughs> it's it's great I'm like, you right didn't now. invest in Sue. You should fire you. <laughs> uh, maybe to help those that are scaling in the region, and it would be interesting to see if we have similar experiences, which countries um, outperform your expectations and which one underperform your expectations before you, you expand it to? Madasar, you want to start? 
Yeah, so we, uh, we tell everyone that our footprint is the greater Middle East, which is a term that we have coined. Uh, and it starts in Morocco, goes all the way to Pakistan. So the disappointments are on the two frontiers. Uh, Pakistan did much better than we expected uh, because we thought, you know, this is a service that requires smartphones, data. You need a certain sophisticated population with some critical mass to, to, uh, to use it. So we've been very, very pleasantly surprised at the ramp up that's happened in Pakistan. And in Morocco, which sounded like an amazing market that should do really, really well, 40 million people, relatively middle income, great infrastructure, we have, been, uh, we have struggled to, uh, to scale because of the unions and the, the challenges with unions. So uh, the two frontiers. I think we went to Morocco four times. Every time we looked at the laws, I'm like, nah, now. Nah. Like, <laughs> the French, right? Four they times. I don't, know, I don't know. What was, like, I think now Amazon has a massive call center there to serve Europe. But when we went, every time, like, seriously? Like, tax? This? Oh, okay, let, let's do it again. <laughs> I agree. Like, this is a country where I think there's a massive potential, but they just don't make it easy for their own yeah. group. And what about in the Gulf? Any, any, any stories on, on the Gulf? I mean, any, any statement on the Gulf countries? So, any... Oman, for some reason, has been more challenging than, than expected, right? I and mean, you would expect places like Oman and Bahrain, where there is a local population that's driving taxis that could be employed with the platform, those markets surprisingly have been more difficult than some of the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, so the only two markets that have been, three markets that have been smooth sailing are Saudi, UAE to some extent, and Qatar. Mm -hmm. They've been very open, or they've become open as a result uh, of us. Whereas uh, in Oman, Bahrain, uh, even Kuwait, it is a struggle due to the regulatory environment, and there is no urgency or there is no uh, uh, nothing pushing them to fix it. Yeah, yeah okay. and I think Saudi is just amazing. I just feel uh, the demographics work, the country is big, um, everything you do pays off much, I think, faster. Here you, you try to get the result, but just the country is relatively small. And I think we tend, if you really index effort, for what you get in return, like you're not putting Saudi in your plan and not thinking that the Saudi youth or the merchants or the cities, the tier two, tier three are like worthy and worth the effort. It's always surprised us how much we get. Like we run White Friday and like the first hour, like, spoosh, like we're just like shocked. Like crazy. How? Crazy like, results. Like how? Like yeah. you're in Dubai comes along, just takes a lot longer and just Saudi just is always amazing. But it is not an easy country to penetrate. I, I it's know. not an easy country because the country is different, right? Yeah. And he has just, Ronaldo mentioned, it, yeah. yeah, things yeah. that work in Dubai, they don't work in Saudi. Yeah. Saudi is very different. And I think for entrepreneurs that might be based in the UAE, you know, of course, you have to be in Saudi. It's the big market that justifies the scale and the investment that goes into building a business like this. But at the same time, you know, the Saudi entrepreneurial ecosystem is very quickly ramping up, right? So people and entrepreneurs that are build, building businesses in Saudi with that inside in the local market, getting the right product market fit natively will start to pose a bigger, you know, bigger competition and bigger threat to people that might be going into Saudi from the outside. Yeah. yeah. You have to be willing, if you take on Saudi as a market, you have to be willing to do the work for that market. I give you like, we want to launch Kindle and we went and we tested readers and we were not happy with the font and Amazon and we went back and said, you know what, we think we need a font for like screens. It just they look like we don't like the Arab. I don't know if you guys read, go to any Arabic website. They're very thin. There's no depth into the font. You try to read, it tires you. Yeah. And we did, like, so if you want to do it, we said, okay, we have to go. Who would go do that? Not many people. Like, that's the mindset you need to do. I'm talking about a very digital product, not operationally. Like, this is very simple. Yeah. Go think of cities and addresses and the, the real challenge for an on-ground operation. But if this is the market, and again, that's what I said. Like, you launch in Dubai, you almost like, right away, your product is not a fit. It's more a fit with Europe than it is with Saudi. You, you have to prioritize that, the features that work there. Um, and for us now that we're doing you know, a lot of work on the Amazon stack, a lot of the work that we have to do is core Arabic is mainly like we could probably launch tomorrow here, but we're mm -hmm. just more focused that we make sure the product is a fit for the base. And I, I say one word always like go there, ask what's the, re the newspaper that's read, and then you get a feel of the work you need to do. If someone says it's a Riyadh, not Gulf News, this one's in Arabic, that was in English, like that said the tone for all the effort you need to do. I, we have a warehouse system. You print the barcodes and the product names. It's just we do it. We designed it. We launched it. Went to Saudi. Takes the SKU. 
We have by die uh, on most of our catalog. And first month we're in the Saudi FC and just we're not getting the pickers to pick. Like you pick X amount, you're picking half. Quickly realized like the barcode we print is the same as Dubai and we're printing the English name of the product. So the guy's like, it has to be English literate and, and they're not. it's not the case. Like as simple as somewhere in a warehouse, the addresses, we have a big courier who doesn't take Arabic addresses into their system. It's a global courier. It's like, well, how do you serve the market? You say you're the biggest in Saudi. Like, how can't you take an Arabic address? And they can't. So we gave them, you know, we had the translation. Who's that? I'm not going to name names. <laughs> um, you don't have to answer. I had to it's ask. frustrating, right? It's like, 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 we gave you the orders, and then, like, they're calling customers. Can we get your Arabic address? Can you get your English address? Because, like, they have to type English, the, the actual... And it's like things like that. So you think like you could use services, but you have to invent. And we ended up you know, building our own network. Uh, it's because so frustrating to work. The labor laws also, there's a whole new challenge. Uh, we find very young, uh, hungry Saudis, but they kind of want to be seniors in the company. And you, you kind of want to tell them you need to start somewhere, and it could be anywhere. And I think that's still it's evolving, but I think that's one of... Uh, you could do that in anywhere else. You could start anyone anywhere. You don't, and it's difficult to bring someone to a, a, a very detail-oriented business where, like, the first job it's like the company, it's the GM, it's like those. You need to start like, hey, let me get a category, let me run content, let me run a warehouse. It's changing, though. I think quickly. Uh, yeah, it's changing. We have uh, ten more minutes, and I want to give uh, the opportunity to the audience to ask some questions. So uh, we have someone here in the front row, Danny. Um, thank you, guys. Um, I have a question to both of uh, to both uh, Modessa and Ronaldo, um, or maybe even Michael, actually. Um, so I think today what we, we were mentioning, I think it was also in the branding exercise, the consistency of a product. Um, and being able to have the same quality w while you expand into different markets. So you, some of you mentioned like, oh, you know, this market's too small, it didn't work. So, you know, we're not, you know, we don't know why. But, you know, isn't it important in terms of consistency? So, for example, if I were to use Kareem in Bahrain, because I'm from there, and I have some pointers on that if you want to know. <laughs> um, you know, if I have a bad experience, I'm, not just, I'm just not going to use it anywhere else, right? So in terms of consistency. Um, and, and the same with, you know, for example, like any of your other sort of services or products that you provide. So when you're going into different markets, how do you ensure the consistency is the same? No, that's a great uh, question, and um, and I think the the strategic lens that we take on our business is that um, we will have to compete with global players to succeed in the region, and we will win by being local, which basically means that you empower the front lines and the cities and the countries as much as possible, and some of this comes at the expense of consistency because a car type will be called something in Bahrain and something else in Saudi and something else in Dubai. Uh, so that consistency gets uh, impacted, but you know, they get to tailor the experience to what that market needs. And we did some analysis if this was the right approach, and we realized that not more than five to 6% of our customer base is actually moving. So majority of the customer base is actually living in one city, moving as in, using as in one city. So, there are very few people that are moving around that much, so the value of consistency is a little bit less. So we chose to empower the front line and let them define the experience, uh, and we believe that that's going to make the experience better than, and more local than competition and help us succeed locally. I can imagine with Amazon, things have, has that, has that impacted the way you had to treat the brand uh, regionally? I mean, for Sue, we haven't yet, uh, I think, had to do things differently. I do agree that Sometimes you're aware like you're just not as good in, on this criteria in a country. And the best way is just to always put them next to each other. Like put all the numbers of all the markets and let everyone see like here are, here's your scorecard today and here's the best. And we should ask like why can't and just challenge. And if you get an answer, okay, why is this? Why is this? And you'll find that ultimately there is an underlying cause that you need to change usually in either the process, mostly is in your system to kind of calibrate, uh, to make sure. I think the best thing for the teams is to see the performance of the others. And we tend initially to not share a lot. And I think this is another learning from Amazon. Like we share more with our teams, especially across geography, 
best of what is where, and I think that helps a lot. Because then you say, okay, you have a real estate agent here doing this, why? And you try to understand uh, why is he not doing the same in Amman versus Beirut? What's, what's the why? And then you find that you may probably have to tweak a process. But I think it's good to have that transparency on the service. And you just can't expect that all countries with the same product, same way of managing it, they would actually give you the same yields. It just doesn't work that way. Michael? We they want Michael to answer. <laughs> no. um, we've taken the approach that even in some markets, we've, t we, we've established a, a different brand. So we're not property finder in all the brands. In, in, in Morocco, we're called Saruti, which means my key. Um, again, because we wanted to be really, really close to the consumers. And um, the, uh, the English uh, brand didn't come across really well in those markets. So, uh, but in terms of product, the, the, the more you localize, the more challenge you have in the, in the long run, but the quicker it is to adoption. And if you're competing with global players like, uh, like you guys are, then the, the localization is, uh, is definitely uh, the angle to win. Hi, uh, my name is Mustafa and I'm from Cairo. I run a startup it's called uh, Breakfast. And my question for uh, Ronaldo and Mudassir, what are the most important criteria when you hire your COO? Well, I think this guy is the real uh, person behind the scalability of uh, the company. Uh, you as a CEO, you set up the vision, the right infrastructure, you manage the whole thing, raising funds, blah, blah, blah. But like, what about the COO? You have a COO? No, we don't. Oh, really? <laughs> So We are the CEO, OOs, maybe. Yeah, I think what happens is you're, we've empowered our tech guy, like I've empowered Wissam to run a lot of the operation, and it took us a long time to hire a CTO, like for him to formalize a different role. So we, like we were heavily involved, because that part you have to have full ownership and a buying top down, and if you can't just have someone like build, you need to make sure it impacts the product availability, the price, like you, if your price change, you may get a return. Because like, so it's, yeah. so we've, we've felt technology, we were very close to our operators. It's like we drove it with tech and it would be me and we Sam would sit with the operator and like, what tool, like what's your problem, what tool you need? We just didn't, I've never, I've always, it was always, a, I've interviewed for it forever. And it came to a point where we were going to hire someone. I'd ask him, like, what do you do? I run this electronic retailer in Canada. Like, how many orders do you do a day? Like, 10. I'm like, well, 10,000. Like, but we're doing X. Like, why would I bring him to run? Like, we're, do we're bigger. So it became harder as we went by. Maybe a couple of uh, thoughts on this topic, right? So I think it seems like if you are looking for a CEO, it's probably the second most important role in the organization. So like any other leadership role, the most important thing is this person should be aligned with your values, with your culture, with your mission, right? That's absolutely the, 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 the essential that you have to ensure that's in place. Beyond that, it depends a little bit of the, 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 what you see as the, as, the, as the thing that needs to be built. Um, the advice that I got was there are certain things that you need to build that, are, that have been built before. Like building a call center, you don't need to reinvent the wheel on building a call center. It's been done before. There are people that have done these things. There are best practices. There are a lot of uh, deep expertise on it. So for that kind of a CEO, you need to get someone on board that knows what good looks like. Because if the person doesn't know what good looks like, that person cannot build what good looks like in a predictable, reliable way. So if that's the, the role of the CEO in a more steady type of operating environment, then you need to get someone that knows what good looks like. In an environment that's fluid and that's rapidly changing, which has been the case with us and maybe with, uh, with, with Ronaldo as well, where the way that you do operations today is only valid for the next six months or nine months, and then because the scale changes or something else happens, you need to reinvent, you need to reinvent, you need to reinvent. In that case, you need to make sure that the person is, is a strong problem solver, right? Is a structured problem solver that's going to continue to look at what's happening in the business and continue to proactively evolve the operations to... Uh, to, to meet the needs of the market at that point. And then lastly, you know, you need to make sure that someone, that person is a good people leader, right? It's a, it's a role that's going to manage a lot of people. They should be able to inspire people. They should be able to lead people. They should be able to get them to uh, motivate them and, 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 and charge them to uh, deliver. I have a question. Sorry, I'm going to uh, jump in. So I actually have one question for the two of you and then a follow-up question to Madassar if you, uh, if you allow me. 
if you had a magic wand and you waved that magic wand and you had one wish, you were granted one wish that would be proved transformational for both your businesses, what would that be? And then maybe Mudassar, just to follow up, I think this is the perfect audience if you're okay talking about it, just the evolution of your vision vis-a-vis -vis the platform play. But I mean, uh, if you're able to talk about it, we'd love you to share it with, I think the, one of the most relevant uh, audiences you could possibly talk to. Uh, the magic one now or before? Um, yeah, good question. I mean, now, now in Mudassar's case. I think, I think now and before for me would be more engineers. More engineers? The ability to like just have more engine. Now and before? It doesn't really change much. But before, maybe for us, we just should never have used the third party logistic, built our own. But now it's more just having more engineers. Yeah, so surprisingly, answer is very similar, Danny. I think a lot of the growth and competitiveness is constrained by the lack of technical capacity and capability in the region. So uh, we have done many things, right? As you know, we have opened offices in Berlin, where we have 100 engineers now. We are trying to move a lot of people from the Silicon Valley who have some associations with the region to move back to the region. Um, so access to talent and also ability to afford the talent, right? You know, our competitor has like 10 times more engineers than we do, and we still need to compete in the local markets with that huge, huge deficit. So being able to then afford that uh, capacity with the scale that we have with this and, and the scale that they have is, is a challenge. So magic wand would be if we can get uh, 10,000 engineers. But what's the solution? I mean, is that uh, Sheikh Mohammed telling you it's an immigration fix and we're going to give 15-year permanent residencies to anyone that works in the knowledge economy? What's, is there a fix that you can think of high level so we can go out and lobby for it? I think we have to go where schools are. Like, that's the issue. We're, we, like, we don't have the pipelines. In most of our markets, the type of schools that are around the markets we're in, maybe Beirut, would be an exception. Amman has one school, hence we have, I don't know how many people there, literally. And then Cairo, maybe, I don't know, we've not had a lot of success there. But I think it's, if I look at myself when I went, someone came to my school, told me you need to get a tech job, hired me, sent me, put me through a very simple training. I became a reasonable engineer within a year, I think, in that company, stayed there five years. We don't have that flow. And the more our companies, I think, are growing, the challenge is, like, can you afford really to spend that time to take the really out-of-college person without a lot of structure and get them to where you want? We're doing it, but that's also required that your leaders are so super focused on a pipeline. And with the deficit you have, you have a priority, and you're focused on, like, you have to prioritize. I think the second one, if that's your deficit, your number second solution is you have to be super focused super prioritize one, two big things instead of 50 small things. You have to say no to everyone who walks into your room, be it amazing ideas and just say, you know what, we're gonna launch for marketplace sellers, fulfilled by Sue, it's all we're gonna do this year. Thank you, it's a great idea. Like, I really love it, like, it's super cool. I think it's amazing. What well, we're gonna do fulfilled by Sue, thank you. Like, that's it. Like, it's hard because you have, you're running a business, so you have a, a, an overhead that to keep the business running, and then you gotta focus on features that will win you what we thought is local empowerment, local features, and then you have a deficit. So you don't have the AIs and all the things you want, and it's like, okay, is search broken? Probably, can we fix it? Yes, is it important then shipping on time? No, okay, let's fix that. So I think Kareem Schools is, uh, is a 20 year fix. I'm looking for the quick wins. <laughs> quick wins, we went to India, we went to, I mean, we went to a lot of places. I am leery of too many like, small remote development centers have not paid us off. Also, if you're not in the local market with the type of uh, brand and jobs that are available, there's always a local entrepreneur who's doing something very like in Berlin, you have SoundCloud and the engineer is Karim or SoundCloud. Like his girlfriend will tell him, go to SoundCloud. Everyone knows you. Like, you know, like their parents will tell him that. So you have to outpace the market. You, the brand is not, as, doesn't resonate. Like if it was where you operate, like if it's real, everyone knows Sue. Like it'll be much simpler than saying, let's go Poland. I mean, we've looked at every, we went to Turkey. We went, I don't know, we've tried. It's quick fix when you have, zero, like we had analytic gap, like you know what, there's no room to build that knowledge. We like, hey, pick a department, 
We think it's, it's needed in six months. Go wherever you find a guy who can lead it. It's really the guy. And then what does it take for this guy to leave what he's doing, build a 20 engineer team and let him build that functionality for you fast? That kind of works. But then long term, you have to suddenly you're like, ah, we need analytics in every team. Search needs an analytic. I'm like, okay, let's migrate them back. And then that, that's so remote. You can't bring that and make it in every team. Mobile is a perfect example as we were evolving like seller tools. Like you wanted it every team. You can't just have a mobile team. It's not going to work. Everything you do is on mobile today. So it's just that migration back, we find that from remote centers becomes super hard. But if you don't have the talent, you have to go somewhere where you can scale that talent or you have to teach your leaders just really like embrace teaching young engineers and just live with some of the mistakes that uh, you have to you know, accept that that's going to happen. I mean, you talked about Sheikh Mohammed, what he could say. You know, the great thing that we have in this part of the world is when a leader says something, it gets Happens. done and a lot of people follow, right? And if the leaders talked about the pride of becoming an engineer and that yeah. people would then want to go to engineering school rather than, I don't know, whether it is medical school or whether it is law school, and they say, this is, you know, the job of the future. You want to be a good Emirati, you want to be a good Saudi, go and learn how to code. If the leader said that, then we would have a lot no. more people you know, who want to join the school. I, I was coming back from the US one time. Thank you, that's actionable. Yeah, and the custom, the custom officer like who's checking my passport in one of the countries just shows you the mindset. He goes, what are you doing? I'm like, I study abroad. I'm like, ah, oh, when? America. Oh, uh, what are you studying? And you know, the guy will not let you pass unless you pay 100 pounds. Like, that's the rule in that country. He goes, I'm studying engineering. Haram. Hadab rule America, Bedros, Handasi. You know, someone goes to the US to study engineering. Why didn't you study See, medicine? It's badly perceived. You know, like, that Poorly was like, you know, the guy let me go without paying the 100 dirham. Like, he, he, felt, <laughs> he felt like mercy for me. He's like, what kind of job did you go? That's the mindset on engineers. Because I think we were stuck with civil engineering as a brand. And civil engineers, you know, construction is good in, in the UAE, but not as good as in many other places. And if you really are, like, the old economy, you're a software engineer, like, you probably wrote an accounting software, and that's what, what people in my country did. I guess the reason I hand you the baton vis-a-vis -vis the platform play is because I think what you're trying to solve it for is actually the reason that, I mean, it's, it's the title of your panel, right? So maybe you can talk conceptually about it. Yeah. So, so maybe just two things to add on this one, right? Uh, because I think it is a core, core issue that's facing, uh, that all of us are facing. Two things that could help, and there is no silver bullet, uh, Danny, unfortunately. That, uh, you know, as the book says, there are a lot of lead bullets that we need to fire. And the two lead bullets are, one is visa immigration is definitely part of the answer. Because a lot of people that we speak to in the US, in Europe, they are not moving because they want to get their passport, they want to feel the security of being in a country that has a different passport. In fact, there have been cases where we have moved people who are working with us in Dubai, and they basically said, Habibi, I want to get a European passport. So we said, okay, you go to Berlin, spend some time in Berlin, and then you can come back and, uh, and work with us in Dubai after you get the passport. So that's definitely one part of the answer. And second, it has a, it's a double-edged sword, so it has some implications, but if we are able to afford the, the, the talent uh, the, and actually sort of pay them a lot more and make it worth their while to come, they will come, right? Now, will you get the right people? That's a question mark, right? You might get mercenaries versus missionaries, but you will start to attract more people if you're able to pay more than what a Google pays or a Facebook pays. But you're actually competing with people that have hundreds of billions of dollars in the bank, and uh, that's not an easy thing to do. So I think maybe those two things could potentially help. Now, on the platform play, which Danny referred to, I think all of us uh, who are scaling or who have scaled have faced the issue where you start a business. In fact, let me take a step back. Let's say you start a company in California for people that have lived in the US. You register a legal entity once. You integrate with some credit card processor. You integrate with some communication gateway. And you do a few other things as the underlying pipe that you need to run your business. And then when you need to go to Florida, when you need to go to New York, when you need to go to Massachusetts, you don't need to do those things again because that integration and infrastructure is common for the entire US. You actually very, very seamlessly target 350 million people living in the US with one infrastructure. What happens in the Middle East? You start a business, let's say, in Dubai. You do these 10 things that need to be done in Dubai. 
legal entity, office, bank account, SMS integration, payment integration, XYZ, ABC. Then you want to go to uh, Bahrain, you need to do the same things again. You want to go to Egypt, you need to do the same things again. You need to go to Pakistan, the same things again. There's so much fragmentation, and the fact that there are no underlying platforms that sort of abstract the region for companies like Kareem and Souk and others creates a massive issue. So the, the vision, what we call the platform vision at Kareem, is that over the last six years, we have actually built a lot of the underlying infrastructure that is needed to operate a consumer internet business in this region. So laboriously, painfully, accidentally, we have done all of these things that you need in each of the 15 countries in the Middle East to run a business like Kareem or to run a business like Souk. And the, then the thinking is, and the hope is, and the dream is, can we platformatize this infrastructure in a way and expose it to the ecosystem so the ecosystem doesn't have to go through the same hurdles and barriers that we went through. So if you're an entrepreneur in Morocco who wants to start their business in Saudi, it is like if you were sitting in California expanding into New York. It's a switch that you pull versus having to do the 10 things, go to the market and do all of those things. So we are hoping that by doing this and platformizing the infrastructure that we have built, we will, inshallah, make it a lot more affordable, a lot more seamless for entrepreneurs in any one of our countries to expand to the rest of the region and, and really start to make the region the United States of Middle East versus the fragmented Middle East that it looks today. So that's the hope and aspiration. Well, I think our time is over. It's been over for 10, 15 minutes. So thank you uh, to Ronnie. Thank you, Modasser. Pleasure sitting with you here. Thank you to the audience. Thank you.